Uh, like to get started. Uh, I know some more people are dribbling in, but we'll, we'll get going, make sure our speaker has the appropriate amount of time. So first of all, welcome to everybody uh, to the uh, kickoff of this year's Distinguished Public Lecture Series that, as most of you know, has been sponsored over the last six years by the Virginia Tech Carilion Research Institute. And this year, it's being co-sponsored also by our PhD program at Virginia Tech, Translational Biology, Medicine, and Health, or TBMH, as it's fondly referred to. So welcome on behalf of the VTCRI and TBMH. Remember all of those initials, please. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, I just want to give people a heads up about upcoming events in this program. So our next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. George Kube, who's also an NIH Institute Director, as is today's speaker. He's Director of the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. Uh, and Dr. Kube will talk about uh, neurocircuitry of addiction and alcohol perspective, and that'll be coming up in a couple months. Just check the website at the VTCRI. Uh, and after that, we have uh, Dr. Peter Moeller, um, who's a professor of internal medicine um, uh, at Ohio State, who will be here uh, to talk about uh, arrhythmias, abnormal electrical activity in the heart. Then Al Reese, the dean of the medical school in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, and then Greg Duncan, talking about immune-mediated disease. David Scorton, uh, the director of the Smithsonian, uh, will be here in the spring. Warren Leonard, talking about cancer and autoimmune diseases. Uh, <clears throat> and then finally, yet another NIH Institute director, Dr. Josh Gordon, the newly appointed director of the National Institute of Mental Health, will be here sometime in the summer. I think we're still working on that date, right? So we have a lot of other outstanding speakers uh, coming up. So please check the website, and I'm sure many of the people here will enjoy the upcoming speakers. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Linda Birnbaum, Director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and the National Toxicology Program uh, as, uh, at NIH. Uh, and I think many of you know, some of you may not know, uh, this is an NIH institute that's located in, in North Carolina, uh, not in Bethesda, uh, one of the major institutes of NIH. Uh, Dr. Birnbaum has been in that role for I don't know, seven or eight years, I may be wrong, but something close to that. Uh, but she's been, she's been at NIEHS longer in a variety of capacities. Uh, she studied biology initially at the University of Rochester in New York and then did her PhD in microbiology at the University of Illinois. I learned today that she and I both did our PhDs in the same building in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. Small world that it is. Uh, from there she went on and did postdoctoral training, uh, first at the University of Massachusetts and then worked for the uh, Masonic Medical Research Labs in New York. Uh, and then became a research fellow of the National Toxicology Program at NIEHS at the Research Triangle Park in North Carolina. Uh, and she became director of divisions and then director of all of NIEHS. Uh, Dr. Birnbaum has received all kinds of recognition for her multiple contributions to better understanding of the interaction of the environment and health. Uh, that includes being elected as a member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies of Science. She is a, has been president of the Society of Toxicology uh, the Environmental Protection Agency has uh, recognized her work uh, by bestowing upon her the Scientific and Technological Achievement Award and the Gold Award for Scientific Achievement in Health Science. Uh, she also has received the Surgeon General's Medallion in recognition of her research and serves on lots of editorial boards and important national committees and does all that stuff. But in addition to all that, uh, she's a first-class world-recognized scientist who has contribu contributed mightily in a number of areas of environmental health sciences. Uh, her work has touched on major issues of climate and health, and I think we might hear a little bit about that today, as long as it's politically acceptable, which I'm sure it is. Um, <clears throat> uh, has uh, made contributions in uh, uh, steroid hormone homeostasis and cancer responses on the effects of halogenated uh, flame retardants uh, and their effects on health, a variety of environmental toxins that can lead to increased breast cancer risk, uh, looking at dioxin exposure, effect of puberty onset. Um, she's done work in uh, biomonitoring and published in this area, a really hot and up-and-coming area about biomonitoring for exposure of individuals to pers persistent organic pesticides, uh, and has al also contributed to her understanding of a variety of tissues in the body, particularly adipose tissue, as a target and a modulator of responses to environmental toxins. Um, without going into any of that in more detail, because she's going to give her talk, I just want to say that as somebody myself who's been very interested in child health and development and very involved nationally with uh, uh, development of children's brains and behavior and health, um, I find it extremely impressive and refreshing when I read Dr. Birnbaum's papers 
that many of which point out initially the unique biology of the developing child, uh, and that is for the biologists in the audience, the respective permeability of the uterine membrane and the blood-brain barrier, and that special susceptibility and window of time when lots of things floating around out there can do great damage to one of the most, if not the most precious single resource in the living world that is a developing human being. So her work not only informs the science, but it informs policy and education matters as well at a high level. So without further ado, I will finally let her talk. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Linda Birnbaum. Well, thank you all for being here. It's really a pleasure for me to come. I can't tell you what a gorgeous drive I had up from North Carolina um, through the mountains, 15 miles an hour, 20 miles an hour, um, <laughs> getting here today. And it's a pleasure. I've been to Blacksburg before, and very honestly, I didn't even know you all existed <laughs> until I got the invitation to come join you here today. So it's, it really is great to be here. What I want to do is very briefly, um, tell you a lot about what NIHS is, what we do, what our interests are, some of what I think are the hottest topics um, in environmental health sciences, and hopefully have plenty of time for questions at the end where you won't hold back when you ask me questions. So we, this is a picture of our institute. Um, actually, it'll look like this in a couple more weeks. Um, but this is what it, it does look like. We are the only part of NIH which is not headquartered in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, it's a great story. We're there because we were a payback from Jack Kennedy to the governor of North Carolina, Terry Sanford, as a result of um, Terry delivering um, North Carolina to Kennedy's campaign in 1960. And that's why we're there. Um, so it's really a, a great opportunity for us. Sometimes it's a challenge, but I look at it more as an opportunity not to be in Bethesda all the time. So like any NIH institute, we have a wide variety of programs. We have a very, very, very vibrant intramural research program, um, almost 1,000 people um, conducting intramural research um, and basic biomedical research. And then we have our extramural program, like any NIH institute, most of our money comes to you and other um, institutes of higher learning as well. We have some things that make us a little bit different. Um, we are not focusing on treatment and cures. And as I'm probably going to say a number of times, the beauty of doing environmental health research is that we can focus on prevention. Because if we understand what it is in our environment that impacts our health, we can do something about it. So we take a very public health approach and again, focus on prevention. Another thing we have that makes us kind of different, I should, I should have said we've got a clinical research program. We have our own little clinic on site, which is great because we are bringing in people and we have an asthma clinic, we have an adolescence clinic for young girls, we are taking biospecimens from people so we can understand what exposures are and so on. Our national toxicology program is actually a program that involves not only NIH but also involves CDC and the Food and Drug Administration. And when I wear that hat as the director of the National Toxicology Program, I actually report to the head of the Department of Health and Human Services rather than to Francis Collins. He doesn't like to believe that, but that's the reality um, because it is a cross-agency um, cross effort. And it's a little different than many of our other programs because it is not a basic biomedical research program. It is a, um, a problem-solving program. We are mandated to conduct toxicity tests, develop new toxicity tests, evaluate hazard information for the literature, and look at the development of alternative, um, alternatives to animal research as well as alternative animals to reduce pain and suffering and numbers of animals used in research and so on. So I think that gives you an, an idea of who we are. We have one other program that I don't mention on here, which is we have a super fun research program and a worker training and ha um, worker training and hazardous waste and emergency response. Very non-NIHE. That's funded through the same um, appropriations committees as the EPA. I think you can understand in the past couple of years things have been a little tight in um, that area. Anyway, so. This is um, just a, a quick introduction to our strategic plan. Um, we did this in a very non-typical strategic plan way. Instead of my closeting myself in a room with my top advisors and saying, what should we do, what should we do, what's our plan, we put out a call 
um, on the internet. We said, give us your great ideas. What are your visionary ideas for how environment, what should be done in environmental health as we go forward? We got over 10,000 ideas. We held some open stakeholder meetings. And when I say stakeholders, I'm not talking just about grantees. I'm talking about the media. I'm talking about um, congressional. Uh, representation. I'm talking about industry. I'm talking about advocacy groups. And we brought them together in a series of meetings and said, what are your ideas? And we ended up coming up with what I think is a um, very dynamic and livable strategic plan. If anyone wants to look at it, it is an easy read. It's about 20 pages long uh, with lots of pictures and available on our website. But we concluded that the mission of our institute is to discover how the environment affects people in order to promote healthier lives. And our vision is that we will provide global leadership for innovative research that improves public health by preventing disease and disability. Now, this is diagram I call the cloud diagram, and the only problem with it is originally, whoops, oh, whoops, I went way, way, way too fast. Um, originally, that center area rotated, but it kind of was like a strobe light and caused some people to have epileptic seizures, so we stopped it moving. <laughs> But the reason that it circulated is we wanted to make the point that you can't do environmental health research without working in a collaborative and transdisciplinary fashion, and that you can't do it without ways to manage big data, big knowledge. And all of the areas actually interact. So if you're talking about fundamental or basic research, that's going to crosswalk with, for example, the translational science. And we need to look at exposure in all those cases. Who is most exposed often in our population? It's often those with the greatest health disparities. So we need to look at our disadvantaged populations, both nationally and globally. We can't do any of this, not only without training and educating the next generation, but improving scientific literacy in the general population. I think you all know that this is a major issue. So we have a lot of outreach and effort and engagement of community groups to get them interested in environmental health sciences, starting with children in the K-6 arena as well. And then, again, we've got to get the message out, and we've got to receive messages from the communities as well. So our research is focused on understanding the interaction of our genes and our environment. Um, I want to try to make the point that nothing is just our genes in our health and nothing is just our environment. Everything is always going to be an interaction. Sometimes it may be more genetic, sometimes it may be more environmental. But we should always remember that because we don't see an impact of whether it's a drug or it's an environmental exposure on someone doesn't mean that it isn't causing an effect on somebody else because there's differential susceptibility and our genes are one part of that. So when I talk about our environment, what do I mean? I guess I'm talking about the biggie. Not only agricultural pesticide, agricultural chemicide, chemicals, <laughs> pesticides and say household cleaners, not only chemicals that you might have in different electronics, not only the air pollution or the water pollution or the soil contamination that we have, not only say cosmetics or synthetic materials, we need to remember that drugs are chemicals, just like chemicals in our environment. And we need to be able to understand that while drugs are, in, are chemicals you take to do something, we don't want our environmental chemicals to do something. But they're all the same kind of chemicals. If we talk about nutrition, and I'm going to come back to this whole, the whole issue, the food that we eat is made up of chemicals and can impact. It's not only the quantity, it's the quality and the chemicals that are present. And then, of course, stress. Stress is mediated by our hormonal systems. And stress is going to interact with other things in our environment. There are a couple other things that I don't have on this picture, which I should add, but I'm going to come to later a little bit about infectious agents and a little bit um, about other kinds of exposures as well. So when we talk about environmental impacts on health, WHO released a report just a couple of months ago that concluded that 23% of all global deaths are linked to the environment. That's about 13 million people a year. Now, that is a minimum estimate because you often don't know that the environment has contributed to mortality because it may be a two-hit phenomenon, a multi-hit phenomenon, but we know, and of this 13 million people, 7 million premature deaths are associated with air pollution, 7 
and that many of those are women and children, especially in the developing world, but some also here, it, also here in the United States, in Appalachia, on some of our tribal populations and so on. So I mentioned genes and the environment and that they always interact. We co-led, along with the National Human Genome Research Institute, a 10-year program called the Roadmap um, Initiative. And we were in charge of the exposure biology part of that. The genetics group, they were trying to identify different genes that play a role in different health conditions. And I can tell you, there's lots of deep sequencing being done trying to understand our genes. And in general, most of the things that have been discovered only contribute less than 1 percent to um, disease incidence. And again, reminding you that there's the interactions going on. In the exposure biology program, some of the things that I mentioned, we were looking at diet, we were looking at psychosocial stress and addictive substances, we were looking at physical activity as an, a kind of environmental exposure, and we were looking at um, different kind of chemical environmental exposures. And basically in this program was focused on developing widgets and gadgets and things that we could get good monitoring of exposure, both external exposure and then biomarkers of exposure. So actually taking blood samples or urine samples or some cases sweat, for example, and measuring what can we measure in them as an indicator of exposure. Another major effort that NIH has had ongoing for about seven years now and that we're participating in is also is the microbiome. And I think you probably all know that we've got at least ten times as many bacteria in our bodies as we do human cells. Ten times as many bacterial cells, I should say. And people, when they think of the microbiome, people are often focusing on the gut microbiome, and we should say microbiomes because the bacteria that are present in your mouth are different than the ones that are, for example, in your stomach, are different than the ones in your small intestines, different than the ones in your colon, and so on. But remember that you also have microbiome on your skin. You have microbiome. It's going to vary depending where it is on your skin. We've got it in our airways and so on, and we're just beginning to really appreciate how important the microbiome is to our health or our disease. And this is one of the issues with antibiotic overuse, never mind that we're developing antibiotic resistance, but in fact antibiotics mess up your own microbiome, which can in, fa in fact either lead directly to disease or lead to a greater risk of disease as well. And we're beginning to understand that the microbiome is absolutely critical in the way that we handle different kind of environmental exposures. Now, I've been talking a little about exposure, and I wanted to mention that there's a whole new approach to exposure. So much of the effort with, um, until very recently, with exposure science, if you wanted to measure what was in someone, you say, well, what chemical am I interested in? Am I interested in DDT, or am I interested in PCBs, or am I interested in triclosan? talking to someone about triclosan today. Um, and, and you would go and you would actually take a biospecimen and measure it. Well, there's a whole new approach called the exposome, which is kind of the totality of human exposure. And in this case, using high resolution, mass spec, mass spec or um, NMR kinds of approaches, you can actually characterize um, about 50,000 different chemicals in 100 microliters of serum. So we don't know what all those 100,000 are, but you can begin to do pattern recognition approaches. You can begin to identify what kind of external exposures or what kind of health conditions are associated with some of these peaks, and then you can go in and identify them. But it's a whole development of a new approach and new te techniques that is going to be extremely exciting and important going forward. So we recently, and when I say we, I'm talking it's the royal we, it's, it's NIEHS and our grantee, our intramural folks and our grantees. Um, but we at NIEHS recently developed something called the CHEER resource, which is actually a way to get environmental, um, well, exposure measurements made. If anyone has had a program that has been NIH funded, it's got to involve children, can also involve their parents, and you've got biospecimens, and you want to know what's in those biospecimens, you can send them to us, and we will measure it for free. 
Some of it will be targeted monitoring. If you want to know if it's triclosan there or if you want to know if it's PCBs there, we can answer those questions for you. But if you want to say, I just want to know what the pattern is so that I can begin to identify things, or if I want to look for a measure of response, do I have change in the immune system, for example? Do, is there change in cytokine levels? Is there a measure of oxidative stress going on? Is there stress going on? You know, can I find that cortisol levels, for example, are elevated? We can answer those questions for you. Again, the focus is on children's health for here, but it's a whole new um, exposure network that we set up with six laboratories around the country with a data repository and analysis center because the amount of data, especially with the exposomic approach, is huge. And um, we need a lot of bioinformatics approaches to try to understand it. And all the samples are being handled by a coordinating center to make sure that we know who has what and where it goes. So we all carry a chemical burden. The CDC routinely tests over 300 different chemicals in people, and they do this on a two-year basis on a statistically based sampling of the American population. And some of these may be chemicals you've heard about. I'm going to come back to some of them, but BPA is in 93% of people. PAHs, that's what you get when you barbecue your steak, or you also get it from diesel exhaust, for example. We've all got it in us. Phthalates are in a lot of plastic tubing and personal care products. Essentially, we all have some of them. The PFCs, those are chemicals like that you may have heard the names of PFOA or PFOS. Those are the Teflon chemicals. They're used in flame retardants, and they're um, used for stain repellency. Um, the PBDEs are a kind of flame retardant um, that we all are carrying in our bodies. Triclosan, which I mentioned before, that has just recently been banned from soaps because, in fact, it didn't provide any antibacterial resistance at the concentration it was in soaps, but we pretty much all have it. And PCBs, which were banned in the U.S. 40 years ago, and yet everyone in this room has PCBs in their body. If you look at, um, when the CDC looked at a number of pregnant women, they could find at least 47 chemicals in every single one of the women um, that they looked at. And you find chemicals in different places in the body, but you find them, for example, many of them, you can find in breast milk. So you're transferring them to the next generation as well, which is actually, um, actually clearer when you actually look in cord blood, when a baby is born, and cord blood was what was nourishing the baby before they were born in utero. So we know that essentially all these chemicals are getting to our infants before they were born, and many of them are then getting to them as well afterwards. Now, our hormone systems are basically control who we are. They control our basic physiology as adults. They control our reproductive life as adults. But during development, they are absolutely essential to normal development. They are very complex, and they, there are many interacting parts. And I will say if you perturb or you disrupt one hormone system, it's going to impact on another. There's nothing that acts in total I isolation. And our hormones operate at very, very low concentrations. And the definition of an endocrine disrupting chemical is a substance or mixture that alters the function of the endocrine system and consequently causes adverse health effects in an organism, its progeny, or populations. And the World Health Organization concluded in, in the report they issued in 2013 that endocrine disrupting chemicals are becoming a global threat that needs to be addressed. So I talked about briefly the importance of our hormone systems, but a point I really want to make is that during development, when our hormones control our very development, we call the, it's an organizational role, this is an extremely sensitive time during development, and effects that happen during development persist, and you may not know about them, until much later, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years later. In adults, in general, you need higher concentrations of hormones, and the effects usually are reversible. So during development, effects are not reversible. During adulthood, effects often are reversible. But sometimes they can act like a second hit on a developmental um, process. And kind of taking a take on a standard you know, slogan that a good start lasts a lifetime, so does a bad start. And I'm going to spend some time talking about how early life exposure 
basically sets the trajectory for the rest of our lives. And why is that? It's because we have windows of susceptibility and development is an extremely sensitive time for exposure. Why? Rapid growth, lots of cell division, lots of cells differentiating from one kind of cell into another. There's very, very rapid metabolism going on. Your immune system is not fully functioned, functioning during development. There's lots of opportunity for cells to be altered um, during development. And development is a really integrated process. And if you throw a monkey wrench into that process, you're not going to be able to re reverse it. We're beginning to understand why a lung cell is different than a heart cell is different than a bone cell or a hair cell. And that's by something called epigenetics. Epigenetics is basically um, uh, modifications of or, or what epigenetics controls when our genes are on and when our genes are off. And it's not changes in your primary DNA sequences, but it's changes and modifications of the DNA and how the DNA is rolled up and expressed. And I like to use an analogy that while our genes are the score of a symphony, the um, epigenetics basically are kind of is your conductor who is telling when the genes to go on and when to genes to go off. And we're understanding that our development is epigenetically controlled. So we have multiple times in our life where we have windows of susceptibility the most important may be in utero exposure, but childhood, infancy, and childhood are critical windows. We all know that teenagers or adolescence is not a stable period of life, and that's true, you know, related to um, exposures as well as kind of psychological stuff. Pregnancy, we often focus again on the developing fetus, but we need to remember that the mother's body is rapidly changing and developing, and so her body is at increased risk, and then old age is another susceptible window. So a point that I want to make, which I think I kind of did, is that we start, things that can happen in gestation may impact you at multiple times in your life. Now, I could make this a lot more complicated and put in the arrows starting from childhood going on and starting arrows from puberty. But the point is, what happens early in life can last for a lifetime. Let's see. So just kind of within the last year or two, I've begun to think well, there was a whole susceptible window that we hadn't focused on very much, and that is preconception. And we're understanding that in the formation of the sperm and the egg, there's lots of opportunities to impact the quality of the germ cells, which can impact fertility. There can be DNA damage. Mitochondria can be impacted. We can change the expression of genes. And the important thing is we can alter the epigenome of our sperms or our eggs, and that has long-term consequences. So we need to begin to think not only what happens in utero, we have to think what happens even before fertilization occurs. And we're beginning to study effects, for example, on the offspring from preconceptional exposure. So the first two studies I'm just mentioning here are, are for, you know, to give you the idea that maternal obesity um, alters the maturation of the egg um, and then has impacts on offspring growth and metabolism. There's also data that shows that effects, if mom is highly anxious or stressed, it impacts behavioral disorders in the kids. And again, this is before she ever gets pregnant, okay? Then if you look at smoking, everybody knows smoking is bad for, for the next generation, okay? I mean, hope levels are going down, but in some populations, they're still really high. And we know that if a mom smokes during pregnancy, the baby is likely to be small for gestational age. We know that there's evidence that um, there may be cognitive and behavioral impacts on the children. M mention a little later that, you know, there's an increased risk of obesity and type 2 diabetes, for example, in children um, that were exposed in utero to cigarette smoke. But we're now finding that smoking before you even get pregnant is associated with an increased risk of congenital heart defects. So again, in the formation of the egg. And we're understanding that some persistent organic pollutants, and here I'm talking about things like some of the old pesticides that were banned 20, 30, 40 years ago, but we're still carrying in our bodies, um, all of us in the room today, that, that preconceptional exposure 
is associated with low birth weight in the offspring, again, before the fertilization ever occurs. But I want to tell you, it's not just moms. Dads matter. And I have to tell you, I was always really, really careful with my girls and now with my granddaughters about, no, you can't eat that fish because it's got too much methylmercury. Or we've got to watch out thinking about their potential for being moms later on. And I always gave my sons and grandsons a buy, you know, because I didn't think about the fact that dads really matter. But we now have data showing, for example, that cocaine exposure to adult males influence anxiety and other behaviors in the offspring. And we're seeing the same kind of thing with alcohol and marijuana and tobacco. We're finding that dad's stress, kind of just like the mom's, affects the stress response of the offspring. And we're finding that, um, that obesity in dad is associated with greater risk of um, obesity and poor semen quality, for example, in the offspring. So I think we, we need to think, it's not only young women we have to be thinking about, we need to think about our young men too. So there are a lot of health conditions that we now have evidence that are associated with something called DOHAD, or the Developmental Origins of Health and Disease. And these are things where it's early life exposure. It could be preconceptional, it could be in utero, it could be infantile, We're associated with increased risk, for example, of learning and behavior, increased sensitivity to infections, increased risk of asthma. Um, testicular dysgenesis syndrome is a complicated syndrome, but is related to um, uh, undescended testicles and hypospadias and testicular cancer in young men. We know that infertility can have an early life exposure um, component. Obesity, I've been given a couple of examples. We know, I um, can't remember, well, we'll know in a minute whether I have the slides about how much earlier puberty is happening today than it was in the past. Um, and again, that may have an early life, um, it, the impact on that may be early life. And then some things that happen to us later in life, like um, atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease and cancer. Um, as well as, for example, neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's disease may be brought about by early life exposures, or at least an increased risk from early life exposures. And a question we're beginning to understand, and I'm not trying to depress people, <laughs> but we're beginning to understand that what happens to your grandparents can have an impact on your life as well. So there's something, there's clearly intergenerational inheritance. There's a lot of data now demonstrating that, for example, clearly what happens to parents can impact the offspring, and now we're finding to, can impact the grandchildren. Transgeneration takes it one more generation, can even impact the great-grandchildren. So there's actually growing data that this is a real impact. Now back to endocrine disrupting chemicals and the kinds of disease risks that can be occur following developmental exposure. Many of these are the ones I showed you with early life exposure before. Cancer, um, infertility, diabetes, early puberty, um, susceptibility to infections, Alzheimer's disease. Kind of it's like pick your, pick your disease and there's growing information that endocrine disruptor exposure early in life can be associated with it. And then we talk about chemical exposures. Certain chemicals are especially bad actors. So BPA is something you've probably heard about. It's been in the news a lot. FDA removed it from um, the hard plastic baby bottles a number of years ago. Um, I could ask, why did we ever need hard plastic baby bottles? But that's another issue. Um, but we know that we're essentially all exposed. And it's been linked, both from animal studies and epidemiological studies to a number of kinds of cancer and altered metabolism and, for example, uh, neurological effects from neural behavior. Um, I mentioned phthalates. I mean, I would just scan through this list and you can see that some of the chemicals to which we're all exposed, I mentioned some of these before, have a variety of health impacts. And I guess that's another thing, point I'd want to make, is there's very rarely an exposure that only does one thing. And we're learning that, of course, in medicine as well. Most drugs are not silver bullets. They often have multiple um, effects. It's the same kind of thing with environmental um, exposures. So one thing I wanted to mention is, is the interaction of the environment with the immune system. Um, I'll just mention it now. 
I, I'm sure you're all aware of Zika and the concern we have for Zika in much of uh, Latin America and Central America. Um, there's a lot of talk about it in Miami, but guess what? This epicenter in the U.S. is actually Puerto Rico, where there are over, over 30,000 confirmed Zika cases and so on. But why is Zika, why has it exploded, basically? And one thing is we think there may be an impact on our immune systems from environmental exposures. But because we're seeing a couple of things. We're seeing that exposure to some of those chemicals that are the PFO and the PFOS that are used in fighting fires and are used, say, in our Teflon products, are associated with more fever in young children, okay? Longer days of fever, less able to mount an immune response. If you skip to the second bullet, and I'm not doing very well with the laser pointer here. Yeah, no, it's there. Yeah. Anyway, if you skip to the third bullet, using these same chemicals, what we're finding is that prenatal exposure, this is based on what was in the mom, is a persistent inability of children to mount a normal response to vaccines. Okay? So in these populations that have been looked at, about 20% of the children, those whose moms were at the higher level of the background exposure, don't mount a therapeutic antibody response. Well, that's of real concern. You know, we've been blaming people for not vaccinating their kids when we get an outbreak of measles or whooping cough, say in California, but how much of it is they're not vaccinating their kids? Could some of it be because they can't mount the normal um, antibody response? Um, we also now, for example, an exposure to methylmercury and some of the things like DDT and DDE and PCBs actually means you have fewer white blood cells. Um, and I should say, some of these studies, they've looked at children at five years, and then at seven years, and then at 13 years, and they continue to study them. And another thing that's interesting is that we're finding that early pesticide exposure is associated with more adolescent body fat. And one thing I should mention here is that, at least I know I used to, as a toxicologist, when I would study my animals, if I found different results in the male and the female mice or rats, I think I'd done something wrong and I'd go back and redo the study, but we've got to celebrate the difference because, in fact, males and females often do respond differently to different kinds of exposures. So I mentioned diabetes and obesity, um, for example. There's growing evidence that a lot of endocrine-disrupting chemicals can actually increase our susceptibility to obesity and diabetes. So I am never going to give you a buy. Yes, you have to exercise. Yes, you can have, you know, 50 bowls of ice cream a day, but are we making it harder for people to control their weight? Are we making it harder for people to lose weight? And for example, we know that nicotine, remember I said that prenatal tobacco smoking is associated with overweight and obesity and diabetes and offspring? Well, we know that nicotine acts like a developmental obesogen, is the term that's being used for chemicals that are associated with obesity in humans. BPA would cause uh, um, affects our pancreas and alters insulin release. Um, there's an association between diabetes and some of those persistent organochlorine pesticides and PCBs and dioxins that we all carry in our body from exposures or from uses that were banned um, 40 years ago. And we know that multiple kinds of pesticides, even some of the organochlorine pesticides, can affect our risk for diabetes um, and obesity. So I'm mentioning BPA because, again, it's, a, it's kind of a hot topic. Um, there's growing evidence that mom's exposure to obesity can lead to obesity of her child. We're finding that the prenatal exposure is associated with increased body fat and waist circumference in inner city children at age seven. We didn't see that associated with the prenatal, in, with the child's level. So it's the, again, just like it was with the suppression of the immune system, it was the in utero exposure that was really important, not the child's exposure, at least for this impact. And one thing that is really important for us to understand is that, for example, a health outcome like obesity or diabetes has tremendous costs for health care. And so one of our grantees, Leo Trasandi at NYU, has actually been estimating what the health care costs are, and he estimates that BEPA exposure is associated with about 12,000 excess cases of childhood obesity. 
which would cost about $28 million a year in additional child health care costs. And this is just some of the data showing the epidemiological data in humans. And what you can see is an increase in um, overweight or obesity, glucose homeostasis or diabetes. This was a review of eight different studies, and it showed that in all cases, there was an increased risk of, in all these different population studies, there was an increased risk um, with exposure. So we know from poisoning episodes or high levels of exposure that chemicals that modulate our hormone systems can have, have human effects. I talked about some of the smoking during pregnancy. Um, I think some of you have seen this very sad picture of a mother holding her severely deformed child um, who was exposed to mercury in Japan, an industrial, um, an industry on the shores of Minamata Bay dumped its industrial waste. It contained a lot of mercury. The mercury gets taken up by, through the water system, gets into the fish. It becomes a methyl mercury, which is very, very developmentally neurotoxic and resulted in, you know, overt effects that you could measure in an individual. Most of the time, you can't measure environmental impacts in an individual. You've got to look on a population basis. So if we look at lead, and lead, of course, the most exposure from lead in this country is still coming from old paint and around. Water is, can be a source. Toys from China can be a source. Gasoline was a major source. But the reason we know that lead is a neurotoxin is because at poisoning levels of lead, you had frank neurological symptoms. But at the low levels of lead, to which many of us in this room were exposed growing up, because lead was only banned from gasoline, which led to huge increases in the late 1970s, there's actually some evidence that our IQs are about five points lower than children today, where the lead levels are so much lower. Uh, DES was many um, people in this room, I assume, have heard about DES. It was a drug used to prevent miscarriage. Unfortunately, it caused vaginal adenocarcinoma in teenage girls and young women. So their mothers were exposed while they were in utero, and there were severe, not only cancer we now know, and in fact, when they got older, the girls and their mothers developed breast cancer, but actually reproductive tract abnormalities in the girls and in the boys. PCBs, I mentioned, we all contain them. There were several poisonings, unfortunately, that occurred with rice oil contamination in both Japan and Taiwan. And again, by looking at the children of those people, they actually where they were called coca-colored babies because they had pigmentation spots. Their teeth and their bones were not formed normally. There were IQ problems in the kids. Again, the high-level poisoning kind of indicates where you might have effects at lower levels. There was a contamination that occurred in Michigan in the 1970s where, unfortunately, flame retardants were mixed in with livestock feed. And it led to contamination of cows and sheep um, and goats, for example, in Michigan. Farm families ate their animals, and also their animals were slaughtered and went to market. And it has led to um, an exposed human population. I mean, it led to actually um, death of many of, the, of the, uh, the, the, the livestock. But people didn't know that. You know, when, when their cows died, they didn't know what they were dying of. They just went ahead and ate them. But we now know that those people who were exposed and their children and now their grandchildren. We can see impacts on their health. And then arsenic, which I understand is an issue in private wells here in Virginia because of the natural geology. And we have the same issues in North Carolina, where we have um, over 16,000 people on wells with elevated arsenic levels. Arsenic contamination, not only of drinking water, but I should say especially of drinking water, because we have studies with very high levels of arsenic in several parts of the world, and we know that not only is arsenic associated with cancer, but it's associated with IQ deficits, cardiovascular deficits, lung problems, and so on. So knowing this from high levels of exposure allows us to extrapolate. This is a little more of the, on the health um, costs of, of endocrine disruptions, and this was actually based on an analysis that was done for the European Union because, frankly, they've got a lot better health records than we do. It's easier to mine the data. And it kind of whether you look by health effect or by type of endocrine disrupting chemicals, you're talking about a cost of at least $160 billion um, excess health costs a year.
those are the kind of figures that have an impact when you're talking um, to politicians. So I mentioned that my national toxicology programs, part of its mission is to actually do testing and develop testing. Well, we can't keep doing testing the way we've been doing it for the last 50 years. I could say, why would we use 20th century methods when we're in the 21st century also? But the point is, if we want to do epidemiological studies, we might be able to do a few a year. If we want to do standard rat and mouse kind of toxicological studies, maybe we can do 10 to 100 a year. If we start going to alternative animal models, and here, the first up on the top is zebrafish, which are um, one of my favorite animal models, just because during development they're totally transparent, so you can actually watch, you know, the, the heart forming and the lungs forming and the somites forming and the, 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 the brain closing are just amazing. But also, for example, fruit flies or worms or tadpoles, another interesting animal model. Or we can start going to the high throughput screening where we can do biochemical or cell-based in vitro assays where we can run tens of thousands of chemicals a day. We can identify pathways that are important and we can try to put all this information together using a bioinformatics approach. And we can move toxicity from a observational science into a predictive science. So there are some new technologies that are developing or expanding to do this going to quickly tell you about the 1,000 genomes in vitro product. This was a great study in which we had 1,086 lymphoblastoid cell lines, or from, a, I should have said from 1,086 people, from nine ethnic groups in five continents. So that doesn't quite cover the entire genetics of humanity, but it's a lot better than what we traditionally do. And we expose these cells in culture to 179 different chemicals, and we looked at the toxicity. And we found a 300-fold variability in the susceptibility of these cell lines. So you had some cell lines that were essentially almost insensitive and others that were exquisitely sensitive. So you've got to ask the question, who's susceptible? Then we said, well, wait a minute. What are we doing with our experimental animal studies? We're Often, we tend to use inbred strains of rats or mice because that controls the variability. Hmm. Well, but maybe it doesn't represent the genetics of rat dumb or mouse dumb. So there's a whole new models that are being developed. There's the collaborative cross and diversity outbred mouse where every mouse is unique, but you know their genetics. So we actually did a study where we exposed 600 mice to clean air or benzene at different levels of exposure, and, and loads of studies have been done with benzene, so we knew what to expect, and we were looking for genetic changes that benzene caused, and what did we find in the variability, in the susceptibility to benzene across mouse them? 300-fold variability. So in many of our risk assessments, we have not been taking account of the tremendous variability that exists in animals or in people. And I have to begin to wonder, are some of the reason that drugs fail, you know, in the testing process and during drug development is because we're testing them in animals that aren't giving us the variability of the animal species, never mind not telling us who might actually be susceptible in humans. Another thing that I think I've indicated is we've got to be able to use all the tremendous amounts of data that are being generated, and we need to manage the informatics that are coming out of it. And I should ask Julia Golke, is this actually one of your slides? I thought it might be. <laughs> so if you don't know Julia, she's a professor here, um, or actually in Blacksburg, who actually did a postdoc at NIEHS. So. We're also developing other tools, new tools for research. And um, I would mentioned to some people those silicon bracelets that you see up there on your right. We are currently field testing these in our children, some children's studies. The kids love them. They can, you, you know, they wear them without any question. The only problem is, is they don't want to give them back. So we have to go and give them the kind of silicon bracelet that doesn't have all the sensors embedded in them. But the sensors, we can identify at least 100 different chemicals that the children will be exposed to by wearing these bracelets. And then we're developing different kind of ways to measure air pollution. And it used to be a great big backpack that people had to wear. That doesn't work very well if you're dealing with young children. We've now developed 
sensors that are basically the size of a deck of cards, which even young kids can wear. And what we're finding is one of the most dangerous places for kids as far as air pollution is waiting for the school bus because of roadway pollution and then the idling of buses um, and the diesel exhaust that often goes along with that. I I'm often emphasizing the fact that you cannot do environmental health research unless you engage the community, either by working with community advocacy groups and citizen science approaches as well. So NIHS has many programs that are focused on community engagement. We have a program called Research to Action. Where we're actually addressing community exposures and community concerns to environmental contaminants. All of our children's centers are looking, all, I should say, all of NIEHS centers, whether it's our children's centers, our breast cancer centers, our environmental health core centers, our Superfund centers, and I'm probably forgetting some of our other centers, our disparity, health disparity centers, we require that there be a community engagement core. Because if you want to work with the community, you need to have them involved from the beginning. They're the ones who have concerns. And basically, you're going to be getting their data. And we need to work with them so that they can understand that um, and, and use it to make their life be better. Um, one thing that I do is I go around the country and do three to five different community forum every year in places where we do have communities with high levels of concern. I was just, for example, about two months ago in southeastern Kentucky in an area where the coal mines basically have been played out and there's lots of concern about health impacts and meet with the communities and listen to what it's really, I call it a forum, but really I'm the listener, um, you know, and the learner at these uh, settings. So we're also trying to improve our evaluation of environmental health um, data by using systematic reviews. Now in clinical medicine, systematic reviews have been used for the last 10 to 20 years. But in clinical medicine, you know what you gave someone, you control the situation, and then you have a measurement. When we're dealing with environmental health issues, we have only a couple of times where we can do a controlled clinical study. I mean, we're not going to expose people to something that we think is going to be a problem. That would not be very ethical. But we have lots of epidemiological, observational kinds of studies. We have lots of animal data that we need to use. And then we have lots of mechanistic studies where there could be cells and culture or other kinds of mechanistic data. And we're developing approaches to kind of combine all this data in a transparent way so that everybody can understand it and integrate these different um, evidence streams. Some of the other key issues, um, you know, I've, I've mentioned a number of them. I kind of didn't, didn't talk about air pollution very much, but global environmental health is a key issue. You know, everything, you know, the pollutants that are produced in China reach the West Coast four to five days later. You know, my scientific director is in China right now, and he sent me an email early this morning, it was late at night in China, and he said, the lowest level of air pollution is 300 micrograms per cubic meter. Our exposure limit is 10 times lower than that. Okay? So, and it doesn't stay in China, of course, it comes here. Health disparities, I mentioned, is a key issue, and environmental health literacy, communication is a key issue. I'm really not going to talk much about climate change, but if climate change is happening, and while so much of the focus on climate change has been on what's happening to polar bears or what's happening to birds and fish, we need to understand that climate change is already impacting our health, and it's only going to increase. And we conduct research during disasters. So we actually started a program called the NIH Disaster Research Response Program, which is the need that if you're going to be able to respond to the next disaster, you better understand what's happening. So to try to get into a disaster, an emergency situation, with obviously we can't impede the emergency response or the disaster recovery, but to get in and get some measurements so that we can understand what's happening and possibly avoid the health consequences later on by getting timely and integrated collection of health and environmental data. We're trying to create a national network of transdisciplinary researchers. We're including the public health communities and the community stakeholders, and we're getting researchers trained. And I should tell you that we have now at NIEHS a institutional review board protocol pre-approved 
So there's the next time there's a major disaster that we want to get involved with, it's not going to take us nine months to get in the field like it did after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill of 2006. We moved hell and high water to get in the field there, and we did it in nine months. But you've obviously missed the early acute kinds of effects. And several of our, um, of our centers have developed and gotten pre-approved protocols that can be used. And all of this information is now available on the National Library of Medicine website. There are something like 300 different pieces of information, drop-down protocols, drop-down um, just information of different sorts that you can, if you go to the NLM website and put in disaster research response, it will come up for you. Now here, given that um, Mark Edwards has been a whole leader in the issue of lead contamination, not only in Flint, but uh, 10 years ago in Washington, D.C., um, I wanted to bring up Flint. and you know. Within a less than a month, there were 1,500 news stories last year. I want to make the point about Flint that this is an example of complete environmental injustice. In many ways, it is not really a public health emergency because finally it was stopped and the levels in Flint didn't get to the levels that anyone needed chelation and hospital treatment. We don't know what the long-term effects are going to be. The focus has been on levels in children. Uh, frankly, I'm more concerned in the levels in elderly because we know that lead, ex lead is stored in your bones. And as you get older and you have some breakdown of your bones, the lead will come out into your blood. And we know that lead is associated with cardiovascular effects on your heart and on your kidneys as well. And nobody is looking at that. Nobody is also looking at what's gone on, what else happened when they switched to the Flint water and didn't prevent corrosion. And there is one of our, we actually have a grantee who is looking at what else was in the water and exposure. So we actually led the science response for the Assistant Secretary of Preparedness and Response. We looked and did a review on low-level lead and provided leadership to the President's Task Force on Children's Environmental Health and reinforced that lead continues to be, be a priority. I mentioned the time-sensitive grant, so several of our groups in Michigan are very involved in the cleanup. And we, in our worker training program, we trained workers who were replacing the lead pipes with non-leaded pipes, but you wanted to do it safely. We don't want the workers to get exposed. And I mentioned Zika briefly before, but we are working along with the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease and the National Institute of Child Health and Development and are doing what's called a birth cohorts in Brazil, Colombia, and Puerto Rico, and Nicaragua. Um, we already had a birth cohort that was being recruited in Puerto Rico in one of our Superfund programs down there. There are going to be 10,000 women that are being recruited who are, have been exposed to Zika in their first trimester. And we're going to be taking monthly samples until their child is born. And then we're going to follow the kids to at least one year of age. And we're all, you know, to try to understand what else is going on with these kids. And we're looking at some of the pesticides, where, which we know in Brazil that pyroproxifen was a larvicide that was present in the drinking water. There is some very limited data that suggests it could be developmentally neurotoxic. And I have to see you, when I see the pictures of the aerial spraying going on down in Miami with NALID, which is an organochlorine, bromine, Phosphate, so it's an organophosphate, and we know from organophosphates are developmentally neurotoxic. Makes me very nervous about what we might be doing. But this is, and again, an emerging issue that we get on right away. So as I said at the beginning, prevention is really the key. Genes and the environment both contribute and interact with each other. Dep the exposure, the impact of the exposure is going to depend upon when exposure occurred and early in life is probably the most important time. And we need to know not only what the chemical, what the hazard is of the chemical, but how much the exposure was to understand prevention. And we can identify environmental factors and modify them much more easily than genetic factors. So it's an opportunity to prevent non-communicable disease. My tagline, you can't change your genes, but you can change your environment. So thank you all. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Dr. Birnbaum. <clears throat> Outstanding presentation.